Hello, and welcome to the ASCO Daily News Podcast. I'm your guest host, Dr. Devarka Devar, and I am an Associate Professor of Medicine and the Clinical Director of the Melanoma and Skin Cancer Program at the University of Pittsburgh's Hillman Cancer Center. I am delighted to have my colleague and friend, Dr. Jason Luke, on the podcast today to discuss key late-breaking abstracts and advances in immunotherapy that were presented at the 2024 ASCO Annual Meeting that just concluded. Dr. Luke is an Associate Professor of Medicine, the Associate Director of Clinical Research, and the Director of the Cancer Immunotherapeutic Center at the University of Pittsburgh's Hillman Cancer Center. You will find our full disclosures in the transcript of this episode. The disclosures of all guests on the podcast are available at asco.org slash dnpod. Jason, it's always a pleasure to hear your insights on the key trials in these spaces. And to have you back as a guest on this podcast to highlight some of the work, especially advances that were just presented. Well, thanks very much for the invitation. I always love joining the podcast. So we'll start very quickly by talking about some advances and some really, really interesting things that happened, both in the context of melanoma, but also in immunotherapy in general. And we'll start by what I think was certainly one highlight for me, which was the LBA2 or the late breaking abstract from Dr. Christian Black and his colleagues on the phase three Nadina trial. This was LBA2, it was a plenary on Sunday. And in this abstract, Dr. Blank and colleagues reported in the results of Nadina, a phase three trial of neoadjuvant ep nevo, this is the flip dose of EP1 nevo 3, versus adjuvant nivolumab in PD1 naive macroscopic resectable high risk stage three melanoma. So, by way of background, uh, neoadjuvant immunotherapy, for those listening, is an area of increasing interest for drug developers and development for both approved and novel agents. Neoadjuvant immunotherapy has been studied with multiple approved agents, including PD1 monotherapy, PD1 LAG3, PD1 CTLA4, TVAC, as well as investigational agents in multiple randomized and non randomized studies. The benchmark pathologic response rates with these agents range from 17% PCR with PD-1 monotherapy, 45 to 55% PCR with PD-1 CTLA-4 combination therapy, a slightly higher 57% PCR with PD-1 LAG-3 as recently reported by Dr. Rhoda Maria from MD Anderson. However, as we embark on phase 3 comparisons for various neoadjuvant compared to adjuvant immunotherapy trials and combinations, we're increasingly moving towards Event-free survival is the primary endpoint for neoadjuvant versus adjuvant studies. And this was most recently studied in the context of SWOG S1801, a study that was led by Dr. Sapna Patel. So Jason, before we start on Nadina, can you briefly summarize the SWOG 1801 trial and the EFS statistic reported by Dr. Patel and her colleagues? Well, absolutely. And these data were uh, reported at uh, ESMO about two years ago and then in the New England Journal last year. And the S1801 study uh, answered a very simple question, which was, what would happen if you took three of the doses of standard adjuvant therapy with pembrolizumab and moved them prior to surgery? And on a high level, the study is as simple as that. And many of us were somewhat skeptical of this trial design because we thought that just moving the doses earlier may not actually have a major impact. In the study, you alluded to the event-free survival statistic. And that alludes to what, what was considered an event. And so without reading all of it, there were several different aspects that were included in terms of time based on the date of randomization until the first of a series of events, such as disease progression, toxicity from treatment, if the patient was unable to go to surgery or had surgical complications, or if they had delay in starting the adjuvant therapy due to toxicity, and obviously recurrence of melanoma or death from any cause. And so uh, in that context, merely moving the three doses of pembrolizumab to the neoadjuvant setting saw an improvement in this uh, two-year event-free survival to 72% for the neoadjuvant therapy compared to 49% for the adjuvant therapy. And so that was quite an outstanding change. And again, noting the power of neoadjuvant treatment, really dictating the impact of anti-PD-1, again, just with three doses moving from adjuvant into the neoadjuvant setting. And I think all of us were somewhat surprised to see that magnitude of a benefit, but it set up the current study very well, where we now look at combination therapy. So let's move to the phase three Nadina trial. Do you want to perhaps discuss the study design, particularly focusing on the EFS primary endpoint, 
and maybe also touching on the different schedules. So SWOG 18.1 was a neo-admin study of three cycles of federalism. And how did that compare and contrast to the neo-admin combination that was studied in Nadina? Well, as you alluded to, Nadina investigated the regimen of nivolumab plus ipilimumab and compared that against adjuvant therapy with nivolumab alone. So in the study, as you alluded, the dose and schedule of the two drugs used was nivolumab at three milligrams per kilogram and ipilimumab is one milligram per kilogram. And that was based on a series of signal finding and safety studies that had been previously done by the same group of authors, identifying that as the optimal treatment regimen. And it's worth noting that's slightly different than the labeled indication that's generally used for those same drugs for metastatic melanoma, albeit that the NCCN also endorses this schedule. So in the trial, 423 patients were randomized on a one-to-one to receive either neoadjuvant therapy with those two doses of nivolumab plus ipilimumab as compared with standard adjuvant therapy with nivolumab following surgery. Now, one interesting tweak was that there was an adaptive nature to the study, meaning that patients had a fiducial placed at the index lymph node. And after the neoadjuvant therapy in that arm, that lymph node was removed, and if the patient had a major pathological response, they did not go on to receive the uh, adjuvant portion of the treatment. So it was adaptive because those patients who did very well to the neoadjuvant did not require the adjuvant portion, and in that patients who did not achieve a major pathological response, they could go on to have the adjuvant therapy, and that also included BRAP therapy for those whose tumors were BRAP mutants. It's also worth pointing out that the definition of event-free survival was slightly different than in the S1801 study, as was alluded to just a second ago. And here, EFS was defined from the date of randomization until progression due to melanoma or due to treatment. And so that's slightly different than the definition in the S1801 trial. So a somewhat complicated study, but I really applaud the authors because I think this study does mirror what we would likely be do in actual clinical practice. So. Just to briefly summarize the efficacy and then to get your comments on this, the PATH response, the PCR rate was 47%. The major pathologic response rate, which is the proportion of patients with between 0 to 1, 10% of residual viable tumor was about 12%. And for a major pathologic response rate of 0 to 10% of 59%. And then the rest of the patients had either pathologic partial response, which was, you know, 10 to 50%, or pathologic non-response, or 50% or greater residual viable tumor, all assessed using central pathology reads. The one-year RFS was 95% in the FPR patient population versus 76% in the pathologic partial response patient population, and 57% in the pathologic non-response patient population. So how do you view these results? Can you context the FPR rates and the EFS rates from the DINA relative to Nevo Rella, and also potentially SWOG 18 you know Well, I think these are very exciting results. I think that for those of us that have been following the field closely, they're actually not especially surprising because they mirror several studies that have come before them. When we put them in context with other studies, we see that these rates of uh, major pathological response are consistent with what we've seen in phase two studies. They're relatively similar, or I should say that the, the results from nivolumab and relatlimab, which was also pursued in a phase two study of somewhat similar design, are somewhat similar to this, but they do look, so combination immunotherapy does look to deliver a higher major pathological response than pembrolizumab alone, as was noted in S1801, which of course the caveat being is these are cross-trial comparisons that we need to be careful about. So I think all of these are active regimens, and I think adding a second agent does appear to enhance the uh, major pathologic response rate. When we look at the event-free survival, we see something similar, which is that uh, numerically, it looks to be that combination immunotherapy delivers a higher event-free survival rate, and that looks to be rather meaningful given the difference in the hazard ratios that were observed between these various studies. And here in the DDA study, we see that 0.3 hazard ratio for EFS is, is just extremely impressive. So, you know, to abstract then from ourselves out of these specific studies, you know, what does this mean more broadly in the, you know, the real world where patients exist and, you know, the rest of the landscape for clinical trials? I think we can't take enough time to stop for a second and just think about 
what a revolution we've come forward in with immune checkpoint blockade and melanoma. When I started my career now more than 15 years ago, melanoma was the cancer that made cancer bad. And now here we say in the highest risk of perioperative patients, we can deliver two doses of nivolumab and ipilimumab, and essentially half of the patients then don't need to go on, more than half the patients don't need to go on to have a full of surgery and don't need adjuvant therapy. And from what we could tell, of a very, very low risk of ever having recurrence of melanoma. Of course, there's the other half of patients where we still need to do better, but these are just fantastic results and I think highly meaningful for patients. In the context of ongoing clinical trials, another abstract that was presented during the meeting was the update to the individualized neoantigen therapy or V940 with pembrolizumab or against pembrolizumab alone. And that's the Keynote 942 study. In that study, they presented updated data at two and a half years for relapse free survival, noting a 75% rate without relapse. So those results are also highly intriguing. Uh, and these are in a similar population of very high risk patients. And so I think most of us believe that neoadjuvant therapy with this study, Nadina, is now confirmed as the priority approach for patients who present with high-risk stage 3 disease. So that would be bulky disease picked up on a scan or palpable in a clinic. And I think essentially all of us now believe patients should get preoperative immunotherapy. We can debate you know, which approach to take, and it may vary by an individual patient's ability to tolerate toxicity because, of course, multi-agent immunotherapy does have increased toxicity relative to anti-PD-1 alone. But we'll have to wait now for the full phase three results for the V940 individualized neoangiogen therapy. And if those come forward, that will be an extremely attractive approach to think about for patients who did not achieve a major pathological response to neoadjuvant therapy, as well as, of course, to the other populations of uh, patients with melanoma, where we otherwise currently give adjuvant therapy stage 2B through all the way through stage 4 receptive. So just amazing time to think about perioperative therapy in melanoma. So this is clearly outstanding data, outstanding news. Congratulations to the investigators for really doing what is an investigator-initiated trial conducted across multiple continents uh, with a huge sample size. So this clearly appears to be, at this point in time, at least a de facto standard. But is this going to be FDA-approved, guideline-approved, or is it for both in your mind? Well, that's an interesting question. This study was not designed with the intent to necessarily try to register this treatment regimen with the FDA. One would have to take a step back and say, with how powerful these data appear, it sort of seems like it'll be too bad if that doesn't happen. But all the same, I think the community and those of us who participate in guideline recommendations are fully supportive of this. So I think we will see this move into compendium listings that support uh, insurance approval, I think, very, very quickly. So whether or not this actually becomes formally FDA approved or is in the guidelines, I think this should become the standard approach that is considered for patients, again, presenting with high-risk stage 3 disease. Fantastic. So now we're going to go in and talk about a slightly different drug, but also from the, in the melanoma context, and that is the safety and efficacy of RP1 with nivolumab in the context of patients with melanoma who are PD-1 failures. So this is Abstract 9517, and in Abstract 9517, our colleagues, uh, academic colleagues in Replimune essentially talked about this data, and we'll start by describing what RP1 is. So RP1 essentially is an HSV1-based oncolytic immunotherapy. And RP1 expresses GMCSF as well as a fusogenic protein, GALV GPR. And in this abstract, Dr. Wong, Dr. Michael Wong from MD Anderson, and colleagues reported the results of Ignite, which is a phase one trial of intratumoral RP1, co administered with systemic nivolumab in patients with advanced metastatic treatment refractory cutaneous melanoma. And the data presented in this abstract represents data from a registration directive, abbreviated as RD registration-directed cohort of RP1 plus nivolumab in PD-1 refractory melanoma. So let's start with the description of the cohort. Right. So in the study, there were a total of 156 patients who were presented, and that included an initial uh, safety and dose finding group of 16, as well as the RD cohort, as you noted, of 140 patients. And it's important to point out that this was a, a cohort that was selected for a very strict definition of progression on anti-PD-1 or a combination immunotherapy as their immediately prior treatments. 
So all of the patients in the cohort had exposure to anti-PD-1, and 46% of them had anti-PD-1 plus anti-CPLA-4, nemolumab and antilimumab as their immediately prior therapy. This was also a group of relatively high-risk patients when one considers stage. So within the stage 4 population, the entry here included 51% who had stage M1, B, C, and D melanoma. And that is worth pointing out because this is an injectable therapy. So trials like this in the past have tended to be biased towards earlier stage unresectable or metastatic melanoma, meaning stage 3B, 3C, 3D, and then stage 4, M1A. Again, to emphasize the point here, these were pretreated patients who had a strict definition of anti-PD-1 resistance, and over half of them, in fact, had high-risk visceral uh, metastatic disease. So in that context, it's very interesting to observe that the overall response rate was described as in the total population as 31%, and that included 12% who achieved complete response. And so again, to make sure it's clear, we're talking about a treatment where the oncolytic virus is injected into one or multiple sites of recurrent disease, and then the patients administer nivolumab as per standard. And so I think these data are quite intriguing. Uh, again, such a high-risk population and their maturity now with a follow-up of over a year, I think uh, makes this look to be a very interesting treatment option. I guess on that topic of mature follow-up, it probably would be important for us to inform our audience that the top line data for the primary analysis was actually just released, uh, I think earlier today, and wherein the central confirmed objective response rate was 34% by modified resist and 33% by resist, clearly indicating that these responses, you know, as you've noted, very treatment refractory patient population, these responses were clearly very durable. So you mentioned that there were responses seen in uninjected visceral lesions, responses seen in both PD-1 and PD-1 CTLA-4 refractory patients. Can you talk a little bit about the response rate in these high-risk subgroups, the uninjected visceral lesions, the patients who are both uh, combination checkpoint and lipid refractory, response rate by primary PD-1 resistance? Sure. You know, I think, again, to emphasize this point, in the study, we saw that uh, there were responses in the non-injected lesions. And I think it's really important to emphasize that. Some have referred to this as a putative abscopal-like effect, similar to what is described in radiation, but it implies that local treatment with the oncolytic virus is triggering a systemic immune response. So in the higher risk patient population, we'll note that uh, whereas the overall response rate in PD-1 refractory patients was 34%, in the combination PD-1 and CTLA-4 refractory patients, the response rate was 26%, so it's still very good. And when we looked at that split by stage, as I alluded to before, in the population of patients that had what you might call earlier uh, unresectable disease, so 3B through 4A, the response rate was 38%. And in the stage 4 M1B through M1D, it was 25%. So slightly lower, but still very good. And, and that would be as expected because, of course, the patients with visceral metastatic disease have more advanced disease. But those response rates look quite good, again, looking at the uh, combination uh, refractory population as well as the more high-risk disease. So clearly, these are very promising data and exciting times for multiple investigators and the field and the company as well. So what are the next steps? I believe that a registration trial is planned, uh, essentially uh, looking at this with the goal of trying to get this combination registered. Can you tell us a little bit about IGNITE 3, the trial design, the control arm, and what you foresee this trial doing over the next couple of years? So as this agent has been maturing, uh, it's worth pointing out that the company that makes this molecule called RP1, but I guess now we'll have to get used to this name, uh, Vizolimogene Odorcarepec as the actual scientific term. They have been having ongoing discussions with the FDA, and there is the potential that this agent could come forward on an accelerated path prior to the results being released from a phase three trial. That being said, the phase three confirmatory study, which is called the IGNITE 3 study, is in the process of being launched now. And that's a study investigating this molecule in combination with nivolumab, as was alluded to earlier, and a randomized phase three design where that combination is compared with a physician's choice, essentially chemotherapy based option. So in that study, it will be 400 patients with stage 3D through stage 4. Patients will have progressed on anti-PD-1, either as a combination or in sequence, 
and then come on the study to be randomized to either visilimaging odoroparecvec plus nivolumab versus that physician's choice. And the physician's choice includes chemotherapy agents, but also nivolumab plus relatinumab as another option, or an anti-PD-1 monotherapy if that's deemed to be a reasonable option by the treating investigator. And the primary endpoint of that study is overall survival. And unfortunately, in this highly refractory patient population, that's something that may not take long to identify with key secondary endpoints of progression-free survival, as well as overall response rate. I'm quite enthusiastic about this study, given these data, which have now been centrally confirmed, as you alluded to before. I think this is a very exciting area of investigation and really crossing my fingers that this may be perhaps the first locally administered therapy, which does appear to have a systemic impact that can hold up in phase three. Great. Very, very, very exciting results. And it's, I guess it's worth all pointing out that this company also has got, I think, multiple studies planned with both RP1 and cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma in a solid organ transplant patient population, where single agent activity has already been reported by Dr. Mickton at uh, prior meetings, as well as a novel trial of potentially RP2 metastatic uveal melanoma, I think the data of which is currently being discussed. So we'll now pivot to abstract 6014. So 6014 is a drug by a company known as Maris. Essentially, it's a very novel agent. Maris essentially is a company that is specialized in making bicyclics and tricyclics. And these are not bicycles or tricycles, but rather drugs that essentially are by specific antibodies. And Maris essentially has come up with Petosemptimab, I think we're going to have to figure out you know, better names for all of these drugs at some point, but Petosemptimab or MCLA-158 essentially is a bicyclic drug targeting both EGFR as well as LGR5. So EGFR, of course, is a known oncogenic driver in multiple tumor types, squamous, including non cell lung cancer, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, but also keratinic squamous cell carcinoma. And LGR5 essentially is leucine rich repeat containing G-protein double receptor 5, but it's a Receptor on cancer stem cells uh, and certainly highly expressed in head and neck squam. And MCLA 158 or is a IgG1 bispecific with ADCC activity because of the IgG1 backbone, co targeting EGFR and LGR5. Maris had earlier results that evaluated petosemptimab mode of therapy. They defined the RP2D in second and third line head and neck carcinoma patients with a respectable response rate of 37%. Investigate assessed ORR with six months median DOR, and this was published by Ezra Cohen about a year or so ago. So in this uh, abstract, Dr. Fayad and colleagues report on the results of the MCLA-158 CL01 trial, which is a trial of pembrolizumab plus petrosemptimab in one uh, frontline head and neck cell population. So maybe let's start with the description of the cohort. And, you know, it is a small trial, but uh, we'll be able, I think, to dig into a little bit about why this might be exciting. Yeah. So as alluded to, it's not the biggest trial as yet, but there were 26 patients with anti-PD-1 treatment naive head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. And all the patients on the study did receive, as you alluded to, pembrolizumab plus pedosymptomab. Based on the label for pembrolizumab, all the patients in this study were pdl one positive. So that's one point that's it's worth pointing out uh, to make sure that that's understood. This is the population of patients who would be expected to benefit from pembrolizumab in the first place. And now in the abstract, they reported out only 10 response available patients, but they updated that in the actual slides of presentation at the meeting. So among 24 patients that were alluded to, 67% were described as having had a response, although some of those were yet to be confirmed responses. And when it was evaluated by PDL1 status, there did seem to be a clear enrichment of response in the PD-1 positive more than 20% group as compared to the 1% to 19% group. That isn't especially surprising because that was a trend that one would see presumably with pembrolizumab alone. But overall, I think these data are, are pretty exciting in terms of a preliminary study. You know, you mentioned that the objective response rate was high, you know, almost 60-something percent. The prognosis of these patients is generally poor. The OS is typically thought of as between 6 to 15 months. And based on Keynote 048, which was led by Dr. Bertness and colleagues, the standard of care in the setting is pembrolizumab plus minus platinum-based chemotherapy regimens, allowing for the fact that we only have 10 patients here. How do you think these results stack up against Keynote 048? And you make a very important point earlier, which was, by definition, pembro is on label only for the CPS. So pdl one score, at least in, in head and neck 
squamous cell carcinoma is CPS and not TPS, but in the CPS 1% of greater patient population where Pembro is on label, how do these results stack up against the KN048 results? Right. So Keynote 048 is considered the seminal study that dictates frontline treatment in head and neck cancer. And before we dive into this too far, we do want to acknowledge that here we're comparing 26 patients versus a phase three trial. So we're not trying to get too far ahead of ourselves, but this is just a preliminary comparison. But in Keynote 048, as you alluded to, two regimens were the superior to chemotherapy. One was the pembrolizumab monotherapy, as well as pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy. So again, the study overall survival, of course, was much higher in the PDL one positive subgroup, which is what dictated the unlabeled use of this. But response to pembrolizumab monotherapy in that population of patients is still modest. I mean, we're talking about upwards of 20 to 30 percent. So if you compare that to, again, preliminary evidence here from this trial of, you know, only 24 patients, that response rate of 60% seems extremely high. And so even if that were to come down somewhat in a larger data series of patients, that still looks to be quite promising as a treatment regimen that might eventually even be chemotherapy sparing for this population of patients. So I think uh, this raises a lot of eyebrows that perhaps this dual targeting approach, EGFR and LGR5, and there may be something uh, really important to the field that uh, evolves on it. So what are the next steps for atosemtumab? You mentioned that the activity was interesting. Are we going to see a larger trial? Any thought on where things are going to go? Well, based on the phase two data of uh, pedosemtumab alone, even without pembrolizumab, the molecule had already been given fast-track designation by FDA, which means allowing for greater communication between the drug sponsor and the FDA and designing a seminal study design. So one would assume that this trial will be rapidly expanded quite greatly, you know, perhaps to 100 or 200 patients to try to flush out what the real response rate is in a more meaningful number of patients. But I think these data will probably also trigger, you know, so the design and uh, probably near-term uh, evaluation or expedited acceleration of a phase three clinical trial design that would potentially validate this against the current standard of care. So I'm uh, pretty excited. And I think we'll see a lot more about this agent in the relatively near future. So finally, we'll pivot to the last abstract that we were going to talk about, which is abstract 2504. So it's a relatively interesting target, CCR8 monoclonal antibody, but this is the efficacy and safety of LM108. And LM108 is a anti-CCR8 monoclonal antibody that is being developed by Lenovo Medicine. And the results that are described are actually a full set of results of combinations of LM108 with anti PD1, two separate anti PD1s in patients with gastric cancer, so mostly done ex US, which is uh, interesting because of this patient population. And it's a full result of several three phase one and two studies. So LM108 is an FC optimized anti CCR8 monoclonal antibody that selectively depletes tumor infiltrating T Rex. The abstract reported a pooled analysis of three phase one, two trials with three different NCT numbers that all evaluated the efficacy of LM108 and anti pd one in patients with gastric cancer. So let's start with the description of the cohort. Maybe, Jason, you can tell us a little bit about, before you start, as you describe the cohort, you know, sort of what we know, in the, editorially speaking, about the difficulty with which T-reg depletion has been tried and, you know, obviously failed up until now in the tumor microenvironment. Right. And so I think that's a, a really interesting comment. And so for decades, in fact, targeting regulatory T cells to alleviate immune exclusion of the tumor microenvironment has been of interest in uh, immunopathology. And in preclinical mouse models, it seems quite clear that such an approach can deliver therapeutic efficacy. However, by contrast, in human clinical trials, Various different Treg depleting strategies have been attempted, and there's really little to no evidence that depleting Tregs from human tumors actually can deliver therapeutic responses. And by that, we're referring to CD25 antibodies. The drug ipilimumab, the CTLA-4 antibody, was uh, punitively described as a Treg depleter preclinically, but that doesn't seem to be the case in patients. And so in that background, this is quite an eye raiser that a, a anti-CCR8 antibody could be driving this effect. Now, before we talk about the results of this trial, I will point out, however, that given the FC optimization, it's entirely possible that the Tregs are be de being depleted by this mechanism, but that more could also be going on. Because FC gamma R2 binding by this antibody that could be nonspecific also has the potential to trigger immune responses in the tumor microvirus 
probably mediated by myeloid cells. So I think more to come on this, if this turns out to be the first meaningful Treg depleter that leads to therapeutic efficacy, that would be very interesting, but it's also possible this drug could have multiple mechanisms. So having said all of that, in the clinical trial, which was a pooled analysis, like you mentioned, of LM108 in combination with anti-PD-1 of a couple different flavors, there were 48 patients treated either with LM108, with pembrolizumab, or with toripalumab, which is another anti-PD-1 antibody. And the drug combination was, generally speaking, pretty well tolerated, noting grade 3 treatment-related adverse events in the range of 38%, which is somewhat expected given combination immunotherapy. You know, we talked about nivolumab and ibulimumab before, which, of course, gives even higher rates of immune-related adverse events, with the most common toxicities being anemia, lipase, uh, elevation of rash, ALC decrease, uh, those all being, of course, uh, quite manageable. So what about the objective response rate? Can you contextualize the efficacy? And as you do that, maybe we'll think about, you know, what you'd expect in the context of, say, gastric cancer, especially in, you know, patients who've never really had a prior checkpoint inhibitor before. What do you think about the ORR? What do you think about the, the relative efficacy of this combination? Well, so in the study, they described overall response rate in the 36 patients as 36% and described immediate progression for survival of about 6.5 months. And so that was among patients who were treatment naive. And in second-line patients, they actually described an even higher response rate, although it was only 11 patients, but they're at 64%. And so I think those data look to be somewhat interesting. When I was actually scrutinizing the actual data presented, it was of some interest to note that the quality of responses seemed to be about as good on the lower dose of LM108, so three milligrams per kilogram, as compared to 10 milligrams per kilogram. So I think there's definitely more to learn here to try to optimize the dose and to fully understand what the overall efficacy of this treatment combination would be. I would emphasize that in this disease, I think a novel treatment strategies are certainly warranted. While anti-PD-1 uh, with chemotherapy has moved the needle in terms of standard of care treatment, it's really a, only a minor subset of patients who derive you know, durable long-term benefit like we normally associate with in the checkpoint blockade. And so I think these are preliminary data that are very intriguing. You alluded to earlier that this population of patients was an Asian data set. And it, it is well known that the efficacy of chemotherapy and immunotherapy does appear to be somewhat enhanced in Asian populations. And that goes to distributions of metastasis and tumor microenvironment effects, et cetera. Very difficult to try to tease any of that out in this abstract, other than to look at these data and suggest that this is pretty interesting, both from a novel therapeutic approach, we talked about the Treg uh, consideration, but also straight up on the efficacy, because I think if these data could hold up in a larger number of patients, and particularly in a Western population of patients, I think it would be very intriguing. So, you know, I'm afraid that we didn't have enough time to talk about all the exciting things that we want to talk about. Certainly, ASCO 2024 had a lot of interesting data, including data from targeted agents, Allura, ADCs. But just focusing on the immune therapy subset, we certainly saw a lot of great advances in patients who were treated with neoadjuvant, as well as relapse refractory disease in the context of RP1. And then a couple of newer agents, such as this potosemtamab, as well as LM108. And of course, we cannot forget to highlight the extended DMFS data from the Pembro vaccine study from Kilo 942. Jason, as always, you know, thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your extremely busy schedule to come and give us insights as to how these agents are impacting the landscape. We really value your input. And so thank you very much. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And thank you to our listeners for your time today. You will find the links to all the abstracts that we discussed in the transcript of this episode. And finally, if you value the insights that you hear on this podcast, please take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. So thank you. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. This is not a substitute for professional medical care and is not intended for use in the diagnosis or treatment of individual conditions. Guests on this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. Guest statements on the podcast do not express the opinions of ASCO. The mention of any product, service, organization, activity, or therapy should not be construed as an ASCO endorsement.